Okay, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Best Practices for Managing Contact Timeframes, Contract Timeframes, if I could say that again. My name's Wendy Molina, I'll be your instructor today. Uh, we are trying something new, trying this live feed class. So if you've joined us online, this is our kind of our trial first time class. So um, please be patient with us if we have some issues. Um, just a little bit about me and how I got here and why I teach um, at all, actually. I, I do a lot of teaching. Um, I've actually been a transaction coordinator for 17 years. Um, most of it with Prudential slash Berkshire Hathaway. Started um, them in 2004. Um, I've worked in the... It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so um, I've been with Berkshire Hathaway Prudential since 2004. Um, I worked in the Mission Hills office. Um, I've worked in the downtown office, and I'm now located in the La Jolla office um, up there. Um, I am a CAR trainer, so I do teach about four classes for California Association of Realtors throughout the state and mostly on their um, CTC, their Certified Transaction Coordinator uh, courses. So I developed uh, four courses for um, CAR. So uh, that's who I am and what I do. Okay, so let's talk about the importance of time frames, okay? So the time frames in the contract keep the file moving by setting guidelines of what buyers and sellers should be doing. So today, for you guys, I'm gonna let you know what you need to be doing during these time frames and how to stay on top of them and make sure that you're managing your clients so that you can meet them, okay? So we did have some time frame changes in our new contract and that's why I wanted to go over the new contract today um, because that is coming into effect come next Monday, okay? Um, if the time frames are not met, there are consequences. And so not only will we go over the time frames, but we'll go over the consequences as well. Okay, so what happens if the buyer doesn't get their deposit in? Or what happens if the buyer doesn't remove contingencies? Or what happens if the seller doesn't give the disclosures? Okay, so we'll talk about all of those items as well. Um, we'll talk about what the list agent should be doing. Okay, um, just because it's uh, the buyers doing inspections and stuff, the list agent still has some contracts that they, uh, timeframes that they need to be meeting and following up on. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. Obviously, we'll talk about what the buyer's agent should be doing. Um, gearing your buyer, making sure they're staying on top of their loan timeframes, making sure they're staying on top of their investigation timeframes, and anything that you should be doing. Okay, and we will talk about all of the different time frames in the contract. Okay, so if you want to take a look at the uh, purchase agreement that I gave you, this is the new one. And the first time frame we come across is the close of escrow time frame, which is number 1D. Okay, so it says close of escrow shall occur on. Now the agent, when you're writing this contract, you can put a specific date in the contract if you wish, or you can mark the box that says or and put the standard 30, 45, 60, depending on how long the buyer needs to purchase the escrow or how long the seller needs to stay in the house, whatever the negotiation may be. Now we all have those things called smartphones, right? Aren't they supposed to make us smart, right? So if your buyer says, hey, I really need to close escrow by November 28th, okay? Can we close escrow on November 28th? Actually, we cannot close escrow on November 28th because that is a holiday. It's the day after Thanksgiving and the county recorder is closed, okay? So what you really need to do is you need to get a list of holidays from the title rep, okay? Everybody should have a title rep in their office and they should easily be able to give you the uh, uh, county recorder holidays. And then you need to put those in your smartphone and then you need to look at those whenever you write a contract because the contract states on or after that date. And if you put the 28th in there, then the file cannot close until the next business day, and this case would be December 1st, 
okay? So the buyer would not make their closing that they need to close by, okay? And it would move to the next business day. So you would actually have to amend your contract to make it close before the holiday, okay? So just check your smartphones. I can't tell you how many people do that or they say, oh, um, I need to close <laughs> on, uh, you know, by a date and it's a Saturday, okay? So if you mark the or and put 30 days after acceptance, if that last day falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, it automatically moves to the next business day. Okay, so if your close of escrow falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, it automatically moves to the next business day. So for example, if it fell on Thanksgiving this year, which is the 27th of, of November, we could not close escrow until the 1st of December because the county recorder is closed until that date. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, what happens if the close of escrow is not met? Does anybody know what happens if the close of escrow is not met? What if the buyer hasn't closed or if the seller can't close? Do you know what kind of remedy that you can make? No? In your little packet, there is a form called demand to close escrow. Okay? So, if your buyer or seller has not closed escrow, and they have removed all contingencies, you cannot send a notice to perform. You have to send this demand to close escrow. Okay? And what this demand to close escrow does is it gives either the buyer or the seller, depending upon who is not able to close, gives them three days to remedy their situation. So say, for example, the seller has to bring in money to close and he hasn't brought in the money. Or say, for example, the buyer doesn't have loan documents. So it gives them the three days to remedy the situation, okay? If the buyer or seller has not closed by the end of that third day, then the other party can cancel the escrow, okay? If contingencies have been removed, the buyer may be at risk of losing their deposit. Okay, so that's why it's important to make sure that we stay on top of our clients so that they are meeting their time frames. And close of escrow is a huge one. Okay, so we need to make sure that the buyers or sellers can make that um, date and make sure that they can close escrow. Okay, anybody have any questions? Yes. Did, did, did you say they can still back out of the contract if this demand to close escrow isn't met? If the all those days? Correct. So if the demand to close escrow has not been met, okay, so your escrow date has to come, right? And if they cannot close within the time frame, then either the buyer or the seller has the right to cancel at that time, okay? And if buyer has removed contingencies, the buyer may be at risk of losing their deposit. Okay? So it, well, how do you remedy that? Well, that is a discussion at the time. More than likely, the buyer will lose their deposit, but it just depends on circumstance. Buyers and sellers can negotiate anything they want, right? Okay? So this is the way to remedy if somebody is not closing escrow. Uh, lately, I've had a lot of deals where we're having a hard time getting loan docs right now. Um, and we've had a few demand to close escrows lately because we're just not getting loan docs in. It's taking a while for whatever reason. Okay. So first time frame is close of escrow. We need to make sure that you don't write it for a holiday or a weekend. Okay, check that smartphone and know what it is. Get your list of county recorder holidays. If it does fall on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, it moves to the next business day. And if the buyer or seller has, it cannot close escrow by the escrow close of escrow date, then the, either the buyer or seller can issue the notice or the demand to close escrow. And if the other party does not close the escrow, then the party issuing the demand can cancel and then they can decide where the deposit goes. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. The next time frame in the contract is the deposit, okay? So um, paragraph 3A 
is the initial deposit and it says the deposit will be in the amount of so much money and it says buyer will directly deposit the uh, deposit with the escrow holder okay so our contract has allowed for the buyer to send that deposit directly to escrow in our new contract it's still, the buyer will be wiring the money okay electronic funds hence wiring because that's the only way to electronically send the money to escrow you cannot send bill pay or ACH deposits to escrow you have to wire the money to escrow okay so the this time frame is counted on business days so the buyer has three business days from acceptance to deposit the money into escrow and I am gonna say that escrows are very keen to this and they do send out a wire instruction okay um, so I'm just gonna go kind of one step deeper when it comes to that wire instruction a lot of escrow companies now are sending as uh, emails secure Okay, so what that means is that you have to have a logon and password to access the email. And the reason why escrow companies are sending secure emails from getting those wires instructions, changing them around, and having your buyer wire money to someplace that's not escrow. Okay, so just keep that in mind. They are sending um secure emails to be aware of that 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 is not unusual and I believe that will be the direction that real estate is really moving is to have more secure things okay so three business days after acceptance that deposit is due what happens um, so buyers agent please remind your buyer to send the deposit Okay, I think sometimes we forget about that. We assume that it's being sent and a lot of times we forget. The escrow company will send those wire instructions. Yes, it does cost the buyer money to wire, to wire the funds. Okay, the bank will charge for that, but that is the best and quickest way to get the deposit out. Okay, um, list agent, what can you do if the deposit's not an escrow? Anybody know what you can do if you, the deposit hasn't been received in escrow? Okay, there's another form called the notice to buyer to perform. Now, this notice to buyer can be used for many things, but one of them is the contractual obligation of getting the deposit in. So if you see on the right-hand side, it lists contractual obligations, and the very first one is the initial deposit. So if the buyer has not put their deposit into escrow within three business days after acceptance, then you can issue the notice to perform. And if the buyer does not get their deposit in, the seller can actually cancel the escrow. Okay? When, what is the time frame? Uh you just send this out. Yes, yeah, so, and so technically a notice to perform can be given two days prior to the expiration of the time frame, technically. But usually what happens in a deposit is that the buyer, if the buyer doesn't have it in by that third day, usually the fourth day they issue the notice to perform. The buyer has two days to remedy the issue. And if they don't get it in, then the seller can cancel. So I want to make one thing clear, and I will go over it in the contract. Our real estate days are 24 hours. They start at midnight, and they end at 11.59, okay? So you have to give the full day before you can cancel, okay? Okay. Um, what happens if the check bounces? So it says right here that the buyer is going to wire the funds, but there is also an option to check saying that the buyer will be giving a personal check. Now, checks probably will only be accepted at escrow for initial deposit. It w checks will not be accepted for closing funds. You have to wire your funds now. Okay. So if the check bounces, if there's non-sufficient funds, 
then you, the seller can also issue a notice to perform if there's non-sufficient funds in escrow. Okay, so buyer's agents. This is where you really have to educate your buyer and let them know that the funds that they're sending need to be liquid. Okay, so if they're writing a check, there better be funds behind that check. Um, if they're pulling money from like a 401k or stocks, they need to ask for that money beforehand. Because usually to get money out of a stock account or 401k, it's at least three days for the uh, stock company or the, or the 401k company to draw the check. Then they have to mail it. Then it's got to sit in your buyer's account for at least 10 days, right? They usually don't release the money. Your bank, the bank doesn't release the money for at least 10 days, especially if it's a large amount. So if they are pulling money from somewhere other than their regular bank account, something that's not liquid, like 401k, stocks, whatever it is, um, you need to make sure that they ask for that money beforehand so it is liquid so that that deposit can be made because, again, the seller can cancel the agreement if the deposit is not in. You look like you have a question. <laughs> well, if they know that... Um you know, they find the house that mm -hmm. they did and they want to make the offer mm -hmm. and they know they're going to have to get their funds. Can't something, can't you negotiate that with the seller? Um, there is a box to, to check, um, to say how many days within three business days or, and yes, you can negotiate anything in the contract, but standard time frame is three days. Okay. Okay, we talked about check bouncing. We talked about making sure they have liquid funds. I think that's it for this one. So let's move on to the increased deposit, which is also number under number three on page one of the agreement. And um, increased deposits aren't really all that common anymore, but there are times when sellers want an increased deposit. Okay, and a lot of times increased deposits are due after contingencies have been removed. So if we look at the verbiage, it says increased deposit, the buyer shall deposit with escrow holder an increased deposit in the amount of so much money within so many days after acceptance or. So buyer's contingency timeframes are 17 and 21 days now. 17 for investigation, 21 days for loan. So normally it would be due within 17 days after acceptance because that's when contingencies are to be removed. If you put in 17 days in the contract, that is a hard date, meaning that the buyer must um, put in their increased deposit regardless if they have removed contingencies or not. Okay, but if you use the or and say when all contingencies have been removed, then that date becomes a uh, fluid with the contingency removal. Okay? So does that make sense? If you put 17 days, that 17th day is when that deposit is due, regardless if contingencies have been removed or not. If you put, use the or and say when all contingencies have been removed, then that date moves with the contingency removal. Okay, probably only about 60% of the time do we do buyers and sellers actually remove contingencies on time. A lot of times there are some extensions, things that go on. Okay, does that make sense? Um, if you have liquidated, I mean, if you have an increased deposit and liquidated damages are in place, the buyers and sellers must sign a separate liquidated damages form to incorporate the increased deposit into liquidated damages. Okay, so liquidated damages, what that does is it limits the amount of money the seller can receive from the buyer if the buyer defaults, okay, and, and removes contingencies. It limits the amount of money to the deposit actually paid or 3% of the purchase price, whichever is less. Okay, so if you have increased deposits, you want to incorporate that money into liquidated damages to protect the buyer. Because if the buyer puts in more than 3%, you want to limit the amount of money that the seller can keep. That's why you want to use that uh, rec uh, receipt for increased deposit. Okay.
Okay, the, the next um, item is um, on page two. Well, actually, now, actually, it's page one is um, verification of all cash. Okay, and that is under number 3C. If it is an all cash offer, it says no lien, uh, no loan is needed to purchase the property, and written verification of funds to close this transaction is attached. Okay, so if you have a buyer that is going to be purchasing the property all cash, you must attach a verification of funds. What is a good example of verification of funds? Bank statement. Bank statement. That's probably the most common way that we get verification of funds. Okay. Do we want to see account numbers on there? No. You want to redact them or black them out. Okay. You can leave the last couple of numbers, but don't show the whole number. Okay. What else might you get besides a bank statement? Okay, so maybe they have stock account or maybe they have 401k. Anything else? What if um, they have a property that they've sold and they're doing an exchange? You might have an estimated HUD from a property. Um, a lot of times people who have a lot of money, they don't want to show you their bank statement. So they get a letter from their banker. So you get letters from private bankers. And the reason why I'm telling you this is that it's not cut and dry, okay? You can get all kinds of things that prove that people have funds. Um, the most important thing to remember is that the seller has the right to approve or disapprove any verification of funds, okay? So, for example, say that um, this, um, the um, buyer gives that letter from that private banker, okay? The seller can say, no, I really want to see their bank statements, the seller can do that and can give a notice to perform for that as well. Okay, so it's under all, all cash verification number Q. Okay, so yes, you, you can ask for that. Okay, um, the verification. Um, okay, so verification of all cash. So if it's not attached, you want to check the box saying that it will be given within three days after acceptance. So in our old contract, we had a week to give verification. Now in the new contract, they really shortened it to three days after acceptance if you did not attach it with the offer. Okay, so that's in that same paragraph. So that's all cash. Let's move on to verification for down payment and closing costs, which is on the next page, which is number um, 3H. It says that the buyer or buyer's lender or loan broker pursuant to paragraph 3J1 shall within three days after acceptance deliver to the sell, uh, seller written verification of buyer's down payment and closing costs, or if the box is checked, the verification is attached. Okay, so... If you don't have the verification of funds with the offer, then you need to make sure the buyer provides that within three days after acceptance. Okay? Here's the trick a lot of times, agents, if you're writing an offer for a buyer's agent, you guys send all that stuff. You send the offer, you send the verification of funds, you send the lender letter. When it comes back signed by the seller, you just get a signed contract. And when you send that to your transaction coordinator, the transaction coordinator doesn't get copies of the verification of funds or the lender letter. So you need to make sure you give those copies to your transaction coordinator because it is required for your file. Okay? I just come from a transaction coordinator perspective. So that's what happens a lot is I get the signed contract, but I don't get the 800 other pieces of paper that went with the contract when, when you guys made the offer as a buyer's agent. Okay? Okay, the, um, so again, the seller can give a notice to perform, okay, if the buyer does not submit the items, but most of, these time, most of the times these items are given with the offer, okay? Okay, pre-approval letter. So the lender pre-approval letter is due within three days after acceptance if it's not attached with the contract again. So... Do you guys want to talk about pre-call versus pre-approval? Do you know what the difference is? 
pre-qualification versus pre-approval? Um, yes and no. So, so in other words, what you're saying is that if you have a pre-approval, then their financial inter, um, information has already been underwritten and they might be asking for more items, okay? So, pre-qual versus pre-approval. I will use you as an example. I forgot your name. Carol. Carol, okay, Carol. Um, you wanna buy a house. Yeah. And do you, uh, how much money do you make? Just make it up. 80,000. 80,000 a year, and you're looking at buying a $400,000 house? Perfect, um, how much money have you saved? Sixty thousand, perfect. We can do fifteen percent down. That's great. And um, have you been at your job for a while? Four years. Four years, perfect. Great. You've just been pre-qualified. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Anybody can call up and answer those questions over the phone, and that lender can write a pre-qualification letter, saying, "I've talked to the buyer. They've been pre-qualified." Okay. Now, what's a pre-approval? I would need to verify that she made $80,000, either look at her W-2s or her tax returns. I would need to verify that she had that $60,000 in the bank with either a bank statement, usually bank statements, the way they do it now, okay? And I would need to make sure that her credit was excellent, right? That she had a um, good credit to buy a, a property. And once I've collected all this information from Carol, then the underwriter would verify that that is good and that she would be able to pre-approved to purchase a property, okay? So whenever you guys are working with a buyer, you wanna make sure that they've met with the lender. Every single one of you has lenders in your office. They're great lenders, they're wonderful. You should be utilizing them, okay? And that their information has been underwritten and that they have a pre-approval letter. Because if you have just a pre-qualification letter, it's more likely something's gonna happen to their loan, okay? So maybe you make $80,000, but when you get your tax returns back, you only show income of 30, right? Because you write a lot of your stuff off. You know, there's lots of things. Maybe you do have $60,000, but it's in a gift from your mom, right? And maybe, the lender's loan product doesn't allow for a gift. So there's all kinds of things. So I wrote on here, build rapport with your service provider. Okay, you all have lenders in your office. Everybody should be meeting with their lender, getting to know them, knowing how they work. Do they meet with your client? What are the things they ask for right away? And making sure that you have that relationship with your lender so that if you have a client, if you meet a client on an open house on a Sunday afternoon, that you can call the lender and say, hey, I have a pre-call for you. Can you please call them and talk to them and get them into your office? Okay? So it is really important to build that rapport. Don't wait to meet your lender when you have somebody or when you have that buyer and they're, the lender they picked isn't working. Okay, so meet your lenders, know who they are. I'm sure they'd be happy to meet you, talk with you, um, and let you know how they work and how they make sure that your client gets taken care of. Okay, obviously home services lending, that's what we're gonna talk about. Okay, um, this pre-approval letter can also be given with the contract. Again, do within three days, but it can also be given with the contract. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about loan contingency. So in our new contract, number J3, um, 3J3 talks about loan contingency removal. Now this is really important to know that our loan contingency has been extended to 21 days. It used to be 17 in the old contract but now they've increased it to 21 days. Does anybody know why they've increased it or why do you think they've increased it? It's never, they never, never ever able to close it. In. You're right, it's nearly impossible, honestly, to get a loan approval done within 17 days. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just to make sure the buyer is on it, that they've been pre-approved, all you have to do is put a property address in there that the buyer meets with the lender as soon as we have a signed contract 
right? Everybody's busy and everybody has lives and for some reason buyers always go on vacation whenever they sign a contract. <laughs> it's true, okay? So they've extended it out 21 days. The other thing is, is that most lenders cannot order an appraisal until the lender's disclosures have been signed. Okay, so the lender has disclosures they have to get to the buyer, and that they cannot generate those disclosures until they have a property address, right, a signed offer. So that's why it's imperative, in order to meet our 21 days, we need to make sure that the lender has the contract as soon as it's signed. As soon as it's signed, we should be getting it to the lender. That the buyer meets with that lender as soon as the contract signed to make sure that they can get that disclosure paperwork signed so that the lender can order the appraisal okay it depends on the lender but sometimes there's a waiting time after the disclosures are signed anywhere from one to seven days depending on how the the um, disclosures are given to the buyer Okay, if they meet with them in person, it's usually a smaller time frame. If they're, they're mailed, then it's a longer time frame. So just be very careful about that, okay? Um, once that appraisal is ordered, we're just really waiting on that, on that appraisal to come back. So as a buyer's agent, once you have a signed contract, you should be letting your buyer know to contact their lender right away. You should be sending the signed contract to the lender. You should be following up with the borrower, the buyer, to make sure that they're getting everything that that lender needs. Okay, so that's your duty as a, as a buyer's agent is to make sure that the buyer's getting that lender everything they need. Okay, a lot of times loans are held up because the buyer didn't get the lender something. The buyer didn't get that profit and loss, or the buyer didn't get the tax returns from two years ago because they can't find them, or the buyer didn't get um, a divorce decree, something. Okay, so we just want to stay on top of that buyer to make sure the buyer's getting the lender everything they need to stay within our time frames. Okay? So, what happens if we can't meet the loan contingency? There's a form called extension of time at ETA, and you guys should have it in your little packet. Extension of time addendum. So anytime your buyers are gonna have a rough time meeting any time frame, whether it be close of escrow, an investigation contingency, loan contingency, you can formally ask the seller to give you more time. And the form is how you do it on that extension of time. Okay. Does the seller have to agree to give you more time? No. But if he does agree, then he, the seller cannot give a notice to perform until this time frame has expired. Does that make sense? Okay. So if, you, if you're having a hard time meeting a contingency, you can formally ask for more time by using the extension of time form, if the seller agrees to it, then they cannot give a notice to perform for that particular contingency. They would have to wait till the next, this new time frame has expired. And again, you can extend out close of escrow, you can send out loan contingency, you can extend out inspection contingency, HOC, whatever it may be. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, also for the loan, we need to get the lender a fully executed copy of the contract. They need the title and escrow information. They need to know if there's an HOA on the property. That is really key, especially here in San Diego. We have a lot of properties that don't have unit numbers. It's just an address. And the lender doesn't necessarily know if it's a single family or if it's a, a attached property until they get the preliminary title report, okay? So we might be 10 days into processing, now they figured out it's a condo, now they have to get a condo cert, and now they have to pay extra money to get a rush. So if we can let them know if it's an HOA, if there's an HOA on the property up front and give them the information, it should be right on the MLS, 
then they can take care of that up front and get their HOA uh, worksheet ordered. And we already talked about the buyer meeting with the lender as soon as the offer is signed. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. I'm a little bit confused on appraisal contingency and lender contingency. So they're two separate. They're now, okay, so in the old contract, they were not. But in the new contract, they are two separate. So the question is, um, she gets a little confused on the loan contingency and the appraisal contingency, and are they one and the same? In our current contract, when you remove loan contingency, you automatically remove appraisal contingency. But in our new contract, they separate out the two contingencies, and that's our next slide. We're going to talk about that right now. Okay, so appraisal contingency. The appraisal contingency now is due... 17 days after acceptance. Okay, so it still is vital that that appraisal get ordered so that the buyers can remove that appraisal contingency within 17 days. Okay, the appraisal contingency now is removed separately from the loan contingency. In the old contract, it was removed together, now it's removed separately. Okay, and again, normally that appraisal cannot be ordered until the buyers meet with the lender to sign those lender disclosures. That's why it's imperative that the buyer meet with that lender as soon as we have a signed contract. Okay, um, let's talk about appraisals real quick. Um, appraisals stick with a property, especially if it's a government loan, if it's an FHA loan or a VA loan. If the appraisal comes in low, that appraisal will stick with that property for six months. Okay, so if you're a list agent and you get a low appraisal and the buyer is purchasing either FHA or VA loan, you're, go you're not going to be able to get an FHA or VA loan on that property for higher than that appraisal. Okay. Now, a buyer can still purchase FHA or VA, they just have to come in with the difference from the appraisal to the purchase price. But that appraisal will stick with that property for six months. I will tell you that this is a huge deal right now because for some reason we seem to be getting a lot of low appraisals, okay? And it's gonna be hard for that seller to resell, especially if it's a government loan. On the conventional side of things, the appraisal does stick with the property, it becomes permanent record, but there still can be another appraisal done on it, and if that appraisal comes in at higher value, it can be loaned on for the higher value. It is nearly impossible to get an appraisal changed, okay, on the conventional side. So if you get a low value and you try to prove that the, the appraisal did something wrong or didn't take the right comps, it's really, really hard to get the appraiser to, to change his value. So just know that most appraisals stick when they're made, okay? Okay, let's talk about ordering inspections and reports. Okay, all inspections and reports need to be ordered as soon as possible. Any seller paid report needs to be given to the buyer within seven days after acceptance. Okay, this includes, well, we aren't going to have termite inspections anymore at, with the new contract, okay? Um, but septic inspection, natural hazard zone report, and any inspection that the buyer asked the seller to pay for. Okay, so this can include CLUE. Are you guys familiar with CLUE report, C-L-U-E? That's for the insurance claims. Okay, so if you ask the seller to provide a CLUE report, that also has to be given within seven days after acceptance. Um, septic inspection. So if you deal with properties, um, the lim 
La Mesa office. I do some deals out in La Mesa office. So we have septic out in El Cajon and stuff. So you just need to be aware you will need to order that. As the agent, you will need to order that. If you use a TC, the TC will order the NHD and the clue report. And we will make sure it gets to that buyer within seven days. Okay. Um, so if you're a list agent, <laughs> you need to make sure that you're seller to have a signed contract okay so I always recommend to agents to go ahead and get the disclosures done before you have a contract because contractually the seller only has seven days after acceptance to get those disclosures out to that buyer okay so here's the deal when do most offers get accepted Does anybody know Friday night at four o'clock. Friday night at four o'clock. Seriously, I left Friday at three in my office. I had three new deals after I left. Okay. So if I don't get into the office till Monday, how, we're already on day three of seven days. Now I have to send all the disclosures to the seller. We're looking at four, five, and six, depending on how quick the seller gets those disclosures back. Okay it's going to be hard to make our time frame so if agents can be prepared and have their sellers be prepared and know that they need to have those disclosures ready because we only have so much time to get things out it will make that transaction go so much smoother the TC will have a, an easier time of getting all the disclosures out they can clean up any little forms that are missing and get all the disclosures out as soon as possible. The hardest forms to get back from the seller are usually the transfer disclosure statement and the seller property questionnaire. Those seven pages total of questions. Okay, and so the seller needs to take some time to sit down and answer all of those questions. In our new contract, under paragraph 10, statutory disclosures, it states that the seller will be giving Fully completed disclosures. Fully completed disclosures. Okay. Fully completed disclosures. Now, and we're looking at paragraph 10 right now, and we're going to be looking at paragraph 10A2. It says, any statutory disclosure required by this agreement is considered fully completed if the seller has answered all questions and completed and signed the seller sections though and the list agent if any has completed and signed the listing broker section or if applicable an agent visual inspection disclosure okay so are you guys familiar with agent visual inspection disclosure okay California law requires that any broker cons ie agent does a diligent visual inspection of the property okay this diligent visual inspection of the property needs to be given with the transfer disclosure statement because that is what is required by law okay so here's the deal <laughs> most agents get that agent visual inspection disclosure to me two days before close because they want to get paid Okay, that's not the way to do it. Right here in the contract, it says the closure needs to be given with the transfer disclosure statement because it is part of the law, and that is what the buyer needs to be receiving. Whether you're on the list side or whether you're on the buyer side, you must be giving this agent visual inspection disclosure. Okay, the next line reads that... Nothing stated herein relieves a buyer's broker, if any, from the obligation to conduct a reasonably competent and diligent visual inspection in, in the, of the accessible areas of the property to disclose on Section 4 of the TDS or an AVID. Okay, so it deliberately calls out list agent, but then it kind of comes back and says it doesn't relieve the buyer's broker from doing it either. So both brokers need to do an agent visual inspection disclosure and this AVID needs to be given within that seven day time frame because it is part of the TDS disclosure and it is now spelled out in the contract 
that the TDS must be completed. And the only way it can be completed is if both agents do their agent visual inspection disclosure. Okay. Hopefully I made that clear. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we talked about. So the time frame, let's move on to paragraph 14. Let's talk about what the seller needs to give. Paragraph 14 is the time frame. Um, so this talks about all of our contingency time frames with the exception of loan and appraisal. Loan and appraisal are spelled out in their own paragraphs. Everything else is dragged into this paragraph. So it says the seller is response, seller has seven days after acceptance to deliver to the buyer all reports, disclosures, and information for which the seller is responsible under paragraph five. Paragraph five is any of the reports. Paragraph six is, it's a new contract, so I'm not quite used to it. Oh, any other terms. Um, paragraph seven, okay, so I, I messed up already. Paragraph five are any addenda, any reports that are, are mentioned in the addenda. Paragraph six are other terms. Paragraph seven are the natural hazard, septic inspection, et cetera. Paragraph 10A, those are the statutory requirements. So like your TDS, your SPQ, all of that. Um, paragraph uh, 11A is the uh, material fact and insurance claims. And 13A is the preliminary title report. So let me go over that again. The seller must be giving the buyer within the first seven days any reports that are in the addenda, like a septic inspection, anything like that. Number seven, which is any reports, natural hazard, septic, anything that's um, mentioned under paragraph seven could be the clue report, anything like that. Oh, 8B, actually I missed one, 8B, so this is a new thing. 8B says that the seller must give the buyer any leased paperwork. If there's something that is leased on the property, such as solar, alarm system, water filtration system, whatever it may be, the seller has to provide that lease information now. Okay, so this is a big thing with solar. Solar has been a big issue with people lately and closing of deals. So if, the, if there is any kind of a leased item on the property, the seller must now give that information to the buyer. Um, 10A, which are the statutory disclosures, such as TDS, SPQ, um, NHD, all of that. 11A is material fact and insurance claims. And 13A is the preliminary title report. Okay, so for the most part, your TC, if you use a TC, will help to make sure that you get all these disclosures out, okay? But you as, a, as the agent still have a responsibility in making sure the seller gets you everything that we need to get out to that buyer, okay? The least items are going to start to be a big thing now. Now, this time frame under 14A can be reduced. A lot of times if they shorten buyer's time frames, they can shorten seller time frames. So if we have a short amount of time, we just wanna make sure that that seller's prepared to get all those disclosures out, okay? Don't shorten your time frame if the seller hasn't filled out disclosures yet. I'm gonna tell you that's, for some reason, I have one agent who consistently shortens the time frame but the seller hasn't filled anything out. So now we're in a rush to get everything filled out and signed and it, it never happens. So <laughs> just saying, if you're gonna do that, make sure you're prepared. Uh, Libby, how important, if anything, uh, it, it, it should a listing agent maybe engage your agent in an TC when they take the listing. Is there value in that? So, so the question is, should the listing agent be engaging their TC at time of listing? Um, I will tell you that our philosophy is yes. We are happy to prepare disclosures for the listing when the agent goes to take the listing. So if the agent lets us know, hey, I'm going to meet with this seller, can you prepare a disclosure packet? We are more than happy at that time to do that packet 
and we want to do it because we're going to look at everything that's needed for that property and know if there's a, a water retrofit, if it's in the city of San Diego. We're going to make sure you have affiliated business. We're going to see to see when the property was built, if we need earthquake hazards or lead-based paint. Um, because for some reason, the agent seems to think, oh, all we need is the TDS and SPQ and we're good to go. But there are so many more disclosures than just this basic statutory requirements. So yes, I think it's important if you have a good TC and if they can take the extra 10 minutes to put together that disclosure packet, we'll be far ahead of the game. And I prefer it because then I know when we go into escrow, we're ready to go. All we have to do is get those disclosures out. So that's, that's a great question, Sam. Okay, let's move on to what happens if the seller does not provide paperwork on time. Um, if the seller does not provide the paperwork within seven days um, after acceptance, the time frame automatically extends to five days after receipt of those items. Okay, so it says if the seller has not provided something to the buyer, then the buyer has five days after receipt of that item to remove the contingency. Okay, so if the seller did not provide disclosures until day 10, the seller has five days after receipt or the time frame which is greater. 17 days would be greater. If the seller did not provide something until day 15, then the buyer would have till day 20 to remove that particular contingency. Okay. The, the buyer can also give a notice to seller to perform. Just like the notice to buyer to perform, they can give a notice to seller to perform. And if the buyer does not get the items, the buyer can cancel the agreement. Okay. So for all these people who shorten it down to 12 days for the buyer to remove contingencies or 10 days for the buyers to remove contingencies, if they don't provide the paperwork until day seven, the buyer automatically gets till day 12. So what's the point <laughs> of reducing timeframes if you're not prepared to give the, the information, okay? Okay, let's talk about buyer's responsibilities. So um, the buyer has 17 days after acceptance. Okay, so this is important to understand. Not 17 days after they get the seller's information, but 17 days from when the contract is signed to complete their investigations, review all the disclosures, the reports and applicable information that the seller provides to the buyer. They should request repairs. You know what, we can email this to you. If you guys wanna leave us your card, I'll email you this so you have this, okay? Um, um, request any repairs and have them negotiate, remove all inspection and appraisal contingencies by day 17, okay? So if you're a buyer's agent, you should be making sure the buyer has done an inspection. You should be making sure that they're getting all the disclosures. You should be reviewing those disclosures because I guarantee you the buyer's gonna have questions, okay? So when your TC sends you a DocuSign for you to sign the disclosures, I love DocuSign, but there is a big flaw in it is that when you go to sign something in it, it just moves you down to the next signature. You have to sign everything before you can go back and review. So before you hit confirm signing in your DocuSign, go back and review the information that you've signed, okay? If you get called to court and your signature's on it, the judge is gonna assume that you reviewed it, okay? So make sure you go back and read the disclosures that are given to the buyer. That way when the buyer asks you, well, why did they mark that there's um, septic on this? I thought it was connected to the sewer. You can say, oh yeah, I did see that. Or I see that they didn't answer a question. You guys should be reviewing those disclosures as well, okay? Um, so you should be making sure they have their, invest their inspections done. You should be making sure that they are reviewing their reports, okay? You should be making sure that they are getting their loan, okay? Now when it comes to inspections, um, the buyer can get any kind of inspection that they want, okay? So if they want a lead inspection, they can have one. If they want to do a plumbing inspection, they can do one, okay? Ghost and that's right. If they, want, if they want some kind of paranormal inspection, they can have one, 
Okay, so don't just limit your buyer to getting a, a home inspection. If they want, they can have any kind of inspection they want. Now here's gonna be the new thing. Because the termite report is no longer in our contract, you're gonna have to give the buyers the option to do that termite inspection, okay? So this is kind of a big deal. Here in Southern California, is has been customary for sellers to pay for a termite inspection, okay? And now, it used to be about 90% of the time the seller would do a clearance. Now it's about 50% of the time that the seller would pay for the clearance, okay? So it's gonna be a hard habit to break for a lot of people here in Southern California. Northern California, they do it a little bit different. So with that said, if you ask for the seller to pay for a report in the contract and you have a loan, the lender is gonna to wanna to see a clearance and they don't care who pays for it. So it's gonna be a learning situation. Yeah, it's gotta be a mind shift, right? It's gotta be a mind shift. It's not a seller responsibility anymore. It's become a buyer responsibility to get that termite inspection. If there are issues with the termite, then you're gonna to have to negotiate it in request for repairs, okay? So if you do have issues with termite, you will have to negotiate that in request for repairs. It's no longer an addendum to add to the contract. And maybe I'm speaking foreign to you because you're all pretty new, but that has been the culture um, as of the past, you know, 15 years, 20 years or so. So right now, you're saying buyer's case. Right now, seller pays for it. Come our new contract, it's not even an option anymore. Well, in the, in the old contract, we had the ability to choose who paid for it still but it was our custom mm -hmm. to automatically check that so right right so now the buyer has to and now sorry. if the buyer would yeah you're gonna have to give it an option so I really see issues on two sides of the fence I see an issue with old school agents adding it to the contract and not asking for a clearance and the lender's gonna want a clearance and somebody's gonna have to pay for that, we're gonna have issues. And I see issue on the flip side where if the buyer's agent doesn't give the buyer an option to get a termite report, if something happens down the road, we're gonna start to be sued for it because we're not giving the buyers an option. So I want to make sure that you guys give your buyers the option to do a termite inspection and if they choose not to, then direct your TC to send them a waiver of termite inspection. Yes. Uh, just because I'm not familiar with termites, um, what is the difference between a clearance and an inspection? So an inspection, the inspector will go out to take a look at the property to see if there's any termite damage. And termite damage could be drywood termites, could be subterranean termites, it could be fungus, could be um, uh, rot, right? Dry rot. So it's any wood destroying pest. Could be beetles. Could be beetles, yeah. And the fees usually around $85 for an inspection. Okay. Then if there are what's called section one items, which are active infestation, if you have termites, if you have dry rot, if you have fungus, then the, that active infestation needs to be cured and needs to be removed and replaced. And then they will give a clearance saying that there is no longer active infestation. Okay, so it is very common here in Southern California to have some kind of a fungus dry rot, termite, subterranean dry wood, very common. And is it common to take those fees out of closing? So here's the deal. In the past, yes, because it was allowed for in the contract. But in the new contract, because there is no option for it, if you pay it through the escrow, the lender is gonna see that there's a fee for a termite inspection and they're gonna want that termite inspection. And if there are any kind of section one items, they're gonna want those clear. Okay, so it's no longer really about the buyer and the seller anymore. It's really about the lender and what the lender requires. Does that make sense? So, you're, it's, so the buyer is really gonna have to pay for that out of pocket. So can you 
have this inspection done as the buyer and not put it anywhere in this yes know if got correct it. correct so as the buyer you can have the inspection done and it is not part of the escrow because it's not part of the contract it's just an option as in any other inspection that a, that a buyer would do whether it be chimney roof plumbing whatever electrical same thing and the lender will not ask you to no. get a termite inspection so I can see it no there. no because it's not part of our contract they won't ask for it once it becomes part of the contract or once something goes to escrow then it becomes a problem because, you know being brand new I don't know if anyone else is but I am within hours of getting an accepted contract here and, and what's today Wednesday I've mm -hmm. got two days to get in on the old one right and, and I mean if it goes to Monday we start the new one so right I'm just like I don't know what to do hopefully you have a mentor never done any, so do I you have a mentor Yes, I do. Okay, so utilize your mentor. Okay. okay, utilize your mentor. Make sure that that mentor gets paid to help you. So utilize that mentor to make sure that you are writing a good contract, whether it be on the new contract or old contract. The only rub is that nobody's really used the new contract yet, right? I can tell you what it says, but until we start to put it into practice, we'll see how people start to utilize it. Okay, does that make sense? But please utilize your mentor. That's what they're there for, and they're there to guide you and help you and make sure that you're on the right track, that you don't make any egregious mistake, because that would be a problem. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so we're going to make sure the buyers ordered all their inspections. Okay, requests for repairs. Okay, 17 days is not the deadline for the buyer to ask. 17 days is the deadline for the repairs to be negotiated. So hopefully you're getting that inspection done within the first seven to 10 days, and that gives you another week to negotiate repairs. Okay, so here's the trick. Lenders are going to start having issues with credits. Okay, so our Custom now is we do request repairs. The buyer says, oh, you know, I'll just ask for a credit. It's easier if we just get $3,000 or $5,000 or $10,000 in lieu of the seller making repairs, right? That's easy. We'll just pass money. Doesn't work that way anymore, okay? The lending system is being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. So in the old days, even though it was just last year, the old days was we could negotiate any credit and usually the lender would approve it and it would be okay. But now lending programs have different limits. If the lender is giving the buyer a credit, there may not be any room for a seller credit. If you negotiate the credit too late, the lender may not allow the credit. And credits in the near future will have to list exactly what it's for. Now we can just do a credit for closing costs or non-recurring or recurring closing costs. But in the near future, you're going to have to say it's a credit for loan origination, for processing, for this, for that. You're going to actually have to list out what the credit is going to be for. I'm not saying don't do credits. I'm just going to say if you are going to ask for a credit to negotiate it as soon as possible, run it by the lender before you agree to it. Run it by the lender. Say, hey, we're looking at getting a credit of $3,000. Is that going to fly with the loan program? I just had this situation happen. Properties less than three hundred thousand. They negotiated a ten thousand dollar credit. I go to the agent. I said, "Are they? Is the lender going to allow for this credit? It's ten thousand dollars on a three thousand dollar on three hundred thousand dollar property." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, guess what? I just got an addendum today. They had to reduce sales price and only give a credit of five thousand. So somebody didn't run it by the lender, or the lender didn't run it by the the uh, underwriter. Okay, so make sure that you run that credit by the lender to make sure it can be allowed for, okay? It's not just cut and dry, okay? And make sure that those repairs are negotiated prior to the 17 days, okay? 
Okay, what happens if the time frame expires? Okay, so in our contract, paragraph 14, we have what's called an active contract. In um, Las Vegas, what did you guys have in Nevada? What kind of, um, agree did you have an active contract or did you have a passive contract or do you know? I don't know. Okay. Passive. Passive, okay. So active contract is contingencies must be removed in writing. Okay, contingencies must be removed in writing and the last item in your little packet is your contingency removal. Okay, so contingency removal. This is how you remove contingencies in writing. Okay, if we do not have contingencies removed in writing, guess what? Contingencies are not removed. And just because your 17 days has flown by and it's passed, those contingencies are still not removed unless the buyer has signed a contingency removal. Okay? So, if we go past the 17 days, here's the deal. Because we have an active contract, those contingencies remain open and the buyer can still inspect. They can cancel the contract at any time and get their money back. They can um, close the transaction. The seller can give a notice to perform. Okay. Technically, we do not have to have a contingency removal to close escrow. But we want to make sure we have a contingency removal. Obviously, if you're on the listing side, you want a contingency removal because you want to protect your seller and make sure that the buyer's money's at risk in case they cannot close the transaction. But if you're on the buy side, you want to make sure your buyer has done all their investigation, that they have satisfied themselves with the property, that they are happy and want to move forward, okay, and that they can get their loan. Once the buyer signs this contingency removal, removing all contingencies, number C down here, then their deposit becomes at risk. Okay. And again, we can use that extension of time if for some reason you need to extend out that contingency time frame. Okay. Okay. Any questions on any of this so far? So I'm kind of giving you the Reader's Digest version of paragraph 14. Usually in my TC class, I go through it a lot more thoroughly, but this is kind of Reader Digest version, so I just kind of want to reiterate what we've gone through so far. Seller has seven days to get all the disclosures, reports, and any documentation the, the buyer needs with after acceptance, seven days after acceptance. Buyer has 17 days after acceptance to remove all investigation and appraisal contingencies, okay? And it is an active contract and they must remove contingencies in writing. Along with that goes, they must remove, they must cancel in writing, okay? You have to have a cancellation of contract. The buyer just can't say, oh, I'm gonna cancel and it's over. We need a cancellation of contract. We need some kind of cancellation in writing, okay? Paragraph 14 also discusses all of the terms for giving the notice to perform. Yes. So if you extend those contingency time frames of mm -hmm. the active contract, you can actually cancel like day 20 or 25? It depending upon when, well, 17? correct. So even if, okay, so let's say day 17 is passed mm -hmm. and by day 20 we don't have a contingency removal, the seller can give a notice to perform on day 20 and ask for contingency removal. And if they don't get it by day 22, because it gives them two days, the seller can cancel on day 23. Mm -hmm. yeah. this, this might not pertain, but, but I can just, in this contract offer that we just wrote, uh -huh. they changed that two days to one and it scared me yes. immediately. And my mentor said, oh, no, don't, don't worry, because if they, you know, tell you today, you still got tomorrow. Yes. So one day is okay? Yes. Yes. I'm so nervous. I mean, it's so... Well, and if, and, it, so, and if you're getting down to a time frame mm -hmm. and say they don't have loan approval and the lender says, I need three more extra days, you can ask for that time. They don't have to give it to you, but you can ask for it. 
And if they give it to you, then they can't give you notice to perform till that next time frame has expired. Okay. Um, okay. So how do we know when our time frame starts? Does anybody know what constitutes acceptance of an offer? Let's dig deep back to principles of real estate. What constitutes acceptance? Nope. Close. Acceptance. Uh, given to tell your broker needs to be told. No. no. But given is communicated. Yes. So it needs to be delivered. delivered. Okay. So let's say, for example, you have the seller. The seller signed the contract today and dated it today, but he didn't give it to you till tomorrow. And then you sent it to the buyer's agent tomorrow. What is our acceptance date? Tomorrow. tomorrow is our acceptance date. So the 20th would be our acceptance date. Not the 19th that the seller dated it because it wasn't communicated to the other side until the 20th. Okay, so that's what constitutes our acceptance date. So if we go to page 10 of our contract, it has a confirmation of acceptance at under the it says a copy of signed acceptance was personally received by either the buyer or buyer's authorized agent. A binding agreement is created when a copy of signed acceptance is personally received by the buyer or buyer's authorized agent, whether or not confirmed in this document. Completion of this confirmation is not legally required in order to create a binding agreement. It is solely intended to evidence that the date of confirmation of acceptance has occurred. Now this confirmation verbiage is at the bottom of this contract and at the bottom of every counteroffer. The confirmation of acceptance is only initialed on the last item agreed to. So if we have five counteroffers, counteroffer number five will be the only one with confirmation of acceptance because that is the acceptance Finally, we've come to an agreement, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're on buyer side or list side, depends on which item it is. So if you represent the seller on counteroffer number five, you would be the one making the counteroffer, so you would be the one accepting the acceptance, okay? So if it was counteroffer number four, the buyer's agent would be making the counteroffer. And if they agreed to counteroffer number four, that was the last item agreed to, then the buyer's agent would acknowledge acceptance. In this offer, the buyer makes it. If the seller accepts this offer as is with no counteroffer, then the buyer would acknowledge acceptance because they are the ones making the offer and they are the ones receiving the acceptance. Does that make sense? Okay. Please do not accept every single item. It's just the last item agreed to. Please. Do it, accept it, and put the date when it was given to you. Because if it's different from the date from when the last principal signed, you want that later date. Because that becomes your day zero. Okay? Also, memorialize with an email back to whoever. Right, right. You would want to right, initial it and send it back and say, our acceptance date, thank you, I just received this today, our acceptance date is today as acknowledged on the counter or the offer, whatever it is. Yes? So if that date is signed at uh, 10 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. it's still that day. Yeah, so let's go to the page before, let's go to page um, 9, and let's read um, under definitions, paragraph 30, let's uh, read days, number F. It says days means calendar days. However, after acceptance, the last day for performance of any act required by this agreement shall not include Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday and shall instead be the next day. Okay, that was the wrong one. Let's read days after. <laughs> days after means the specified number of calendar days after the occurrence of the event specified and not counting the calendar date on which the specified event occurs and ending at 1159 on the final day. Okay, so our real estate days start at midnight, end at 11.59. Just because you're not in the office or you leave your office at 5, 6, 7 o'clock, whatever it is, real estate still goes on. Okay, so technically that buyer has till 11.59 to get you that contingency removal. Okay, back to the, the one before that, the days, the last day for performance of any act required by this agreement. So, um... That really implies that if something is due, if seller's disclosures are due, if the buyer's contingency removal is due, and that due date falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, it moves to the next business day. 
Okay, so if you had a contingency removal that was due on Thanksgiving, you wouldn't have, well, I guess you would have to give it the next day, which is Friday, the 28th. Okay, but if it fell on Saturday, you wouldn't have to give it till Monday. Okay, so it, it just gives you a little bit of an extension. Yes? I'm worried, like, say for example, you know, how often do you check your phones and emails and all these kinds of things? So here I am sitting in class, and this guy has just told me, this other agent, mm -hmm. yes, we've accepted your contract. In mm -hmm. what legal... Um, What's my word? Capacity or? Do I have to give to my buyer? I mean, I'll, I'll get home and say, oh, Jim, the guy just accepted it and it's 7 o'clock tonight. And yes. He accepted it at three. And you should be calling your client and letting them know that they have an accepted offer because today your time frames start ticking. Today is day zero, tomorrow is day one. But I have to acknowledge that I received it, right? But that's okay. You can acknowledge, you can reply back to the agent saying that you've received it and then you can sign the acknowledgement tomorrow and date it today. Okay, so you can sign it tomorrow, but date it today. Okay, so that today is still day zero. Okay, it's not when you're able to print it out and sign it. It's when you've received it. What if I didn't check this anymore tonight? It's still, it's still when he, it's still when he sent, it's delivery. But even though I didn't get it that day, it was delivered that day, huh? Yes. Because we had to accept it. As in after it was delivered, to say, yes, I got it. Well, you should be. But if, um, uh, it's, it's delivery, delivered and received. Delivered and received? That's what it's talking about. So, so what, what agents will do is actually have red receipts. This is why it's important for you to have a, a red receipt on your email. So that way, when that email gets sent out, and you get that notification that somebody opened the email, then you have delivery and received as part of your confirmation. Yeah, it is kind of a it's kind of a hazy line, right? Well, yeah, but if you look if you look at section uh, thirty of uh -huh. acceptance, it does say that the acceptance constitutes delivery to and personally received. Okay, gotcha. By party or Our party's authorized, authorized agent. Authorized. So, so you can't necessarily. Um, identify that somebody's received it by just emailing it to them right without a red receipt or without following up and saying hey I just sent you the signed contract can you please check to make sure you received it right. so one or the other so good, good call that's a it's a tough one because it says delivery is what constitutes but it, it says it does clarify here so delivered and received okay, okay. So what number was that so number 30 a mm-hmm Okay, so I've been reading this a hundred times over for the last 60 days. Yes. Because <laughs> that's a new paragraph, right? Uh, well, just we oh, no. Over and over and over and over. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're at the end of our class. Okay, so it is the responsibility of both agents to take responsibility for their own time frames, right? Just because you're an agent and you give it to a TC doesn't mean the TC is on their own and they're going to finish up the contract for you. Okay, there is a huge thing going on right now in our TC world with the BRE coming down uh, on brokers if their TCs are doing any kind of licensed activity. So just know that your TC is there to be a processor for you, okay, and to process, help you process the paperwork, to help you stay on your timeframes, and to help make sure that you have everything that's required in that broker file. Okay, it is still your responsibility as an agent to make sure you stay on top of your time frames. Um, and it's a, the responsibility of the agents to keep your age to keep your clients on track. Okay, I know a lot of agents who like to say uh, kind of wash their hands and Since they've sold the property now, they think they're done once you've sold the property. This is when it starts Okay, and I think that the um, I, I, Just an observation I have is that everybody teaches you how to sell But they don't really teach you what to do once the contract signed Right? And that's what this class is all about, is making sure that you know what to do once that contract's signed and what you need to be doing with your client. Okay, It is the responsibility of both agents to review the disclosures, to make sure they're complete, and to make sure the buyers receive the disclosures in a timely manner. 
okay? Your TC should be communicating with you as to whether or not they've received disclosures or they've received items. And if your TC reaches out to you and says, hey, agent, I haven't received something, I haven't got whatever it is, then you need to be contacting that other agent and saying, why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? Where are the seller's disclosures? Why haven't they provided this? That is still your responsibility. We just kind of let you know, hey, we don't have it. We need it. This is what's going on. Okay. Any questions on anything? Yes. Is there a concise chart that says one day, three day, five day, seven day, seventeen day? You can look so at here's the beauty of here is the beauty of real estate. No, it's not cut in stone. You have your contract. Your contract lays your foundation. Okay, I always, my, my big speech when I give my TC class is I liken real estate to the game of baseball. Okay, in order to play the game of baseball, you have to learn the fundamentals. What are the fundamentals of baseball? Throwing the ball, catching the ball, hitting the ball. Once you practice baseball, then you can play the game of baseball. And that is very much so in real estate. Here's your fundamentals your contract, okay? Is every single game of baseball exactly the same? No, what changes in each baseball game? Well, the players, right? The players change, the field changes, and that's same in real estate. We have, you still have gloves. Real estate, we have contract and disclosures and time frames, but when those players get involved, it changes the whole game up. Right? So this is your guideline. This is your foundation. This is everything you need to follow. Okay? It's right here for you. But the numbers don't change. If there was something that showed me the five things I need to do, day one, day three, day five, whatever days are mentioned in here by number, then I can, you know, stay on track by looking at, not at 27 pages, but at one page, with the numbers well, up. I think that's good homework for you to read through the contract and pull those numbers out. Are I can get order in here by date. By yeah, date, pretty much. By numbers. Well, kind of, sorta. The only thing that's out of order is the the loan contingency. But for the most part, it starts three days, three days, three days. Then it goes to twenty one. Then it goes to seven. Then it goes to seventeen. But if you pull out what the buyer needs to do and what the seller needs to do, it should be easy for you to understand. I could easily give it to you but then you won't learn it. Mm -hmm. I am very big on people making sure that they understand it. I've done, I know the stuff inside and out, backwards and forwards. I could do this in my sleep. I do this all day long, eight times a month. I teach this contract and I know it like the back of my hand. How do I know it? Because I've years and it takes time and it's not going to happen tomorrow. You have to practice real estate. You have to practice just like baseball. It's the only way you get better at anything. But you'll be okay. That's what your mentor's for. Okay, so any other questions? Okay, give, uh, this is for the benefit of everybody that's online, <laughs> otherwise they won't be able to hear me. So uh, first give uh, Wendy a big hand, huh? She's, she's really, really perfect. I have had the great pleasure of knowing her for most of her professional career, and I have most to tell it. you, <laughs> yeah, um, I've been 22 years in this business, and so uh, when my wife got into the business, it was right around when uh, Wendy got into the business, and I have to tell you, she is one of the best practitioners that you will find in this industry. We have a lot of great TCs within our company, most of which she's trained. <laughs> a lot the of years. them, yes. Um, and so I would encourage you to, if you're not already doing so, use a TC because it does make your life easier. Um, it gives you another set of eyes to be looking at things. But when you select the TC, because I will say, while we have a lot of great ones within our company, um, there's not a lot of great ones out there. <laughs> there's a lot of people who claim to be TCs um, uh, because they have been involved in a transaction one way or another. But the problem is, is that a bad TC can really cause havoc in your uh, file, especially if you have the bad habit of just turning your file over and not being involved. 
you really need to watch out for that. Okay? And that's and that's not going to be allowed for anymore because the BRE is really coming down on those things. Um, the other thing is is that each one of you has a really good TC in your office. All of your TCs have been working, I would say, at least. Um, maybe Nicole, not as long, but the rest, Marianne Vlani has been around forever. WRD has been around forever. They know what they're doing. They're really great TC, so utilize them. So again, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody uh, for joining on today uh, on this test pilot of our live streaming of our classes. We're going to work our, our, our hardest to be able to uh, produce more of these types of classes for you so you don't have to drive. <laughs> these wonderful people have today. So, but thank you very much for tuning in. I appreciate it, and thank you all for coming. Okay? Have a yes, good thanks, Bye. guys. So was there a notification that there yes I'll email you the slides Sam just sent them to me so leave me your cards and I'll and I'll get them to you okay.